All right, okay, so hello, dears. <laughs> Wait, man. <lang>. All right. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay. Hello, dears, again, and welcome back uh, to the continuation of our pre recorded lecture in our class in parasitology and for our topic that is uh, the amino acids for human parasites. And for this uh, video, we're now going to start with the different types of amino acids for human parasites. And we're going to start now with the first type, which is your complement fixation technique. Okay. Now, for complement fixation technique, uh, we then describe what are complements. Now, inside your body or in your body, we have what we call complements. Now, complements, these are proteins, again, that are normally present and whose overall function is amination of inflammation. So basically, these are substances found in your body that um, are involved no, in um, inflammation. And aside from that, in um, antigen uh, clearance, okay, in antigen uh, detection and even uh, antigen elimination. Okay, so this part of your uh, immune system, the complements. Okay, the complement system. Okay, now uh, these complements, um, the complement fixation technique, we then um, employ the ability of your complements, okay, uh, to uh, react with an antigen antibody uh, immune complex. Okay, your complements are triggered usually, or they're activated inside your body when there is an antigen antibody. Uh, complex okay so we then use that <laughs> we then employ that principle in a test okay which is your complement fixation technique okay um this fixation or the activation of your complements or the binding of your complements to an antigen antibody uh complex is known as fixation of the complement and this fixation of complement prevents the complement prevents the complement from reacting with cells sensitized with other antigen antibody complexes. Okay, and RBCs are usually what we use. Uh, RBCs that, that have a, a hemolysis or an antibody that can promote hemolysis attached on the surface of RBCs are added in the test system to detect if the complements in your test system can still lyse the RBCs or not anymore. Okay, all right, yeah, to indicate the presence of unfixed com com complements. And if there are unfixed complements, it can now lyse the, uh, the RBCs, okay, which then leads to the result, all right? And the absence of hemolysis indicates that the complement has been bound already in the initial uh, testing stage, all right, and it's not anymore able to lyse your RBCs. So, to, so I think mas makasabot mo, or to let you understand more, we have an illustration again based again from Sir Jemu, the best. So we have, here we have the reagent antigen. Okay, let's say you are testing for usually complement fixation tests are used for detecting antibodies. Okay, so let's say you are testing for antibodies to amoeba. Let's say amoebiasis or antibiotic zoonotica. So in your test system, you have a reagent antigen, which is example. Um, Antamoeba histolytica antigen. Okay, let's say the reagent antigen. So that is the reagent antigen is manufactured. Usually, you get that from a commercial commercial uh, producer or whatever. So it's manufactured. Okay, so you order that from a store or whatever. Okay, all right. Now you add your uh, patient sample. Okay, so you're detecting again antibodies to Antamoeba histolytica antigen. Okay, let's see that your patient sample has the antibody, okay? So positive shot for an antibody to antibiba so that they can eat antigen. So what happens is, if you, after you add the sample that contains the antibodies to your antibiba so that antigen, of course, it will now bind with your reagent antigen, which is antibiba so that can antigen, okay? So the antibiba so that antigen, the agent, okay, will now bind to the patient sample that may contain the antibodies to antamoeba histolytica. Okay, that gets? All right, so they will bind. Okay, all right. Now, in the other scenario, let's say the patient doesn't have any antibodies. Okay, all right. So, of course, there, there are no antibodies here, so it's free. Okay, the patient antigen, uh, the reagent antigen, sorry, the reagent antigen, which is your antamoeba histolytica antigen, is free. Okay, no antigen antibody complex is formed. Okay, now, we then add your complement. Okay, now, complement, um, our sources of complement in the testing system here is usually from guinea pigs, okay? All right, here. Guinea pigs, okay. So we add the complements from guinea pigs, again, depending on the manufacturer, okay? So we add the complement, okay, and the I recall that complements can bind to an antigen antibody complex, okay? So in this case, in this scenario here in the left side, 
since there's already an antigen antibody complex, the complement will then bind uh, yeah, to your antigen antibody complex. And this is now the term complement fixation. Again, when you say complement fixation, the complements have been used up already, okay? Because it has already been bounded, or it has already binded, bound to your antigen antibody complex, okay? All right, and in this case, in the other scenario, since there's no antigen antibody complex, the complement is free, okay? There is no complement fixation. There are unfixed complements, okay? So this is the first part of the testing system. Now, we add now the indicator system in the case of your sheep RBCs, right? Your sheep RBCs, again, are coated with hemodicin. So in this case, at the surface of the sheep RBCs, there's already an antibody that's attached there. And this antibody, known as a, a hemodicin, can promote hemolysis, okay? So uh, these sheep RBCs, again, with hemolysin are manufactured, okay? You get that from, again, a supplier or whatever. Alright, okay. Now, in this part, let's say that again, the complements have already been fixed. Alright, so therefore, the complements have already been tied up in the initial antigen antibody reaction. So, therefore, the complements cannot bind anymore to the antibodies here present on the surface of your RBCs. Gets? Alright. Now, in the other scenario, of course, the complements are free, right? Because there's no antigen antibody reaction in the initial uh, stage, right? So therefore, the complements are free to bind uh, yeah, with the hemolysin on the surface of your RBCs. So what will now happen next? All right. So of course, since the complements have already been um, bounded or binded by the initial antigen antibody reaction in the first stage, if the patient has the antibody, all right. So therefore, the positive result is no hemolysis. Right? That's the positive test. It means that the patient has an antibody to the particular disease. In this case, our example, entamoeba histolytica antigen. So therefore, the patient is positive for an antibody to entamoeba histolytica. All right. Whereas, if the patient is negative, the complements are free, so it will now bind to the hemolysin attached to the RBCs, which now triggers cell lysis. Okay? And it leads to hemolysis. And that is a negative test. Meaning, negative, the patient doesn't have any antibody against that particular infection. In this example, entamoeba histolytica. Alright? Okay. <laughs> I hope you understood. Okay? Sana naman. Alright. So, very, ano yan, third year na talaga to na topic. Promise. Okay? Alright. If, uh, if you don't understand pa, uh, in my YouTube channel pa rin, in the playlist, you know, there, there are other videos in immunology serology for complement fixation. But it's, if you want to watch that, you can also watch. But I hope uh, <laughs> you also got this. Okay? Alright. So, that's the first um, amino assay. That's complement fixation. Okay. Now, we go now to your fluorescent immunoassays. Now, fluorescent immunoassays, by the name itself, we use fluorescent dyes or fluorophores, okay? And uh, these fluorophores, uh, fluorophores, sorry, or fluorochromes, yes, fluorophore, fluorophores or fluorochromes, okay? They at, they're attached to an antibody, okay? All right, they're attached to an antibody. And this now serves as a label. Ayan, sana ko sa mga, mga gusto may label dyan, all right? So these now serves as a label, okay? Alright, so later you'll understand more. So we then observe this label, fluorescent tag, uh, which suggests the presence of your antigen antibody complex, okay? And the common fluorophores we use are your FITC, fluorescein isothiocyanate, which emits a green or apple green fluorescence. And you have, uh, this is FITC, and you also have TRITC, tetramethyl rhodamine isothiocyanate, which emits a red fluorescence, this one. All right. Now we have two ways. You have the direct fluorescent antibody test, and you have the indirect fluorescent antibody test. Now for the direct fluorescent antibody or direct immunofluorescent assay, we detect antigen. Okay. All right. And for indirect uh, immunofluorescent antibody, we detect antibodies. Okay. All right. So dano chika ayan sige. So uh, I'll let you see the uh, illustration para mas makasabot. Alright, now for the direct fluorescent uh, immunoassays, but we are detecting um, antigen. Okay, so it's unknown. We don't know what is the antigen. Okay, alright. So let's say you want to detect if the patient has an antigen to a particular parasite. Alright, so in the solid phase, okay, made, uh, solid phase could be microtiter plates, microtiter wells, could be slides, microscope slides. Alright, so you then um, put the antigens there of the patient, okay, or of the unknown. Alright. And then what you do next is then you add 
a labeled antibody which is these are antibodies that at the top of it no at the top of it are fluorescent so therefore um, it's an antibody that has a fluorochrome okay or a fluorophore all right attached to it okay so these antibodies will then react with your antigen okay and of course um, these are now examined under your fluorescence microscope um, and uh, you will then look if um, say you have fluorescence, the intensity of the fluorescence. Okay? Alright, so basically easy lang, direct immunofluorescent assay or direct fluorescent antibody. So you're detecting a known antigen in a solid phase, example microscope, slide by antigen. Then you add the reagent, which is your labeled antibody. So these are antibodies that has fluorescent or fluorochromes attached to it. Okay? And then they react. Okay, of course they bind to each other. And then after binding, you then examine under the microscope for fluorescence. You examine under the fluorescence microscope, okay? Not the normal bright field microscope. Fluorescent, okay? <laughs> and of course, uh, we then measure that, okay? That's direct um, immunofluorescent assay. Direct meaning uh, you let the antigen and the labeled antibody, fluorescent labeled antibody, react uh, immediately or directly. That's direct. That's the meaning of direct, okay? But for the indirect, <laughs> For the indirect, what you're detecting now is patient antibodies, okay? So, you're detecting if the patient has antibodies against a particular parasite bug or disease, okay? So, in this case, your solid phase antigen, this is now known, this is your reagent, this is a manufactured uh, solid phase antigen that is specific to the parasite or to the disease that you are detecting. So, example, you want to detect if your patient has um, antibodies to Georgia, okay? So therefore, this solid phase antigen is a Georgia antigen or an antigen of Georgia duodenalis. Okay? So again, that's manufactured. You get that from a supplier. Okay. Then you add then your patient sample. And we are now expecting that the patient sample has antibodies to Georgia antigen, to these antigens. Okay? So what do you think will happen next? Of course, because they are antigen antibodies specific to each other, they then bind. Again. So, antigen antibody combination so that's the meaning of indirect because you let it first react okay separately all right so after this uh, procedure what you do next is we then wash okay the whole thing maybe through uh, washing yeah maybe through water or depending on the testing system of the manufacturer gunner, to remove the unbound antibodies of the patient because we want to make sure that what remains there are the antigen antibody complexes okay all right and after this after washing to remove the unbound antibodies of course it now follows the same procedure with your direct we then add your labeled um, anti-immunoglobulin okay so when you say anti-immunoglobulin these are antibodies against these antibodies <laughs> these are again uh, manufactured you get them from a supplier these are antibodies okay they are in the form of antibodies that are detecting or that are against the antibody that is attached here. Okay, that's why it's called anti-immunoglobulin because it's an anti against, diba? against an immunoglobulin, which is an antibody. So it's an anti-antibody. Okay, so it's an antibody against an antibody. Okay, but this is your reagent. Again, it has a fluorochrome, fluorophore attached to it. Okay. Alright, ayan. So in this case, the resulting is of course still the same fluorescence. But look at here, diba? the anti anti uh, the anti immunoglobulin or what we call anti AHG, anti human globulin, diba? is not attached to your antibody. Okay, because again, in direct immunofluorescent assay, we're detecting for patient antibodies. Okay, alright. So I hope you guess that. So still the same, measure the fluorescence. Alright. So for direct, diba? direct immunofluorescence. We're detecting patient antigen or the parasitic antigen. Basta we're detecting antigen. The antigen is unknown. Alright. And then we immediately let it react with your labeled antibodies. Okay? So they react and then examine under fluorescence microscope. Diba? So that's direct. For indirect immunofluorescence, you first um, you have a solid phase antigen which is known, okay, which is known, and then you add first the serum of the patient because we're detecting antibodies, okay, of the patient. So they first react, incubation, that's the incubation period, okay, you let it first react. Then after reacting, you wash everything, okay, to remove unbound antibodies. And after washing, you then add now the labeled, fluorescent labeled anti immunoglobulin or fluorescent labeled antibody against the antibody of the patient, okay? So this will now bind and will now produce fluorescence. 
and these fluorescence is then measured and examined under fluorescence microscope. Okay, that gets lang the difference between direct and indirect. Okay, sana naman. But uh, again, third year, very third year concepts na talaga. So I just included para sige lang, para if you don't really entirely understand, understand it, sige lang. Basta as long as you are already introduced to it. Okay, sapper. I hope I hope I understand. <laughs> okay, all right. Ayan. Okay, sige. And we now have what this table, the reading of fluorescence. Ayan. So. I made, made it sure talaga that I get to introduce this to you because the third year now, during their second year <laughs> years, <laughs> uh, I introduced this to them. Okay, and now I introduced it to you so that you already know. The grading of uh, FITSI, fluorescence, because this came out in the board exam, not in my, I'm not in my board exam, not, not in my board exam, but in previous board exams. Alright, so negative, no apple green fluorescence. One plus is faint or unequivocal. 2 plus is apple green, 3 plus is bright. Okay, so, nagpabibo ka, bright. Pero, ganap siya kung magpabibo intense, 4 plus, brilliant. Okay, ayan. So, very, very, ano na, gas, 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 gas na to sa discussion ko, actually. I always, always discuss this. Kaya, let's look na, mag-aw sa puts boards. For at least, you already know as early as now. So, again, grading of it, C, fluorescence, negative, no apple green fluorescence, 1 plus, faint, Yet, unequivocal, meaning di pa siya kung klaro na apple green fluorescence. 2 plus is apple green lang, so kalma na ka. Okay? And then 3 plus, nagpabibo ka light, nagpabibo ka konti, 3 plus bright. But nagpabibo ka intense pa, nagpab nagpabibo ka more, para may 4 plus, para brilliant. Okay? Alright, so you'll have your own mnemonics. Kamu na bahala if you want your own mnemonics. Go lang yun. Okay, <laughs> alright. So that's for your fluorescent amino acid. The, the main point lang is we use flu fluorochromes okay, as labels. So mga gusto na mga labels siya. Okay, alright. That's labels. Okay, next we go down to uh, the next type which are your agglutination reactions. Your agglutination reactions are one of the reactions of your antibodies and antigens. But this time, the antigens are particulate. When we say particulate, these are antigens that are quite big, that are insoluble, meaning they are solid in nature. Okay? Alright, so uh, these are agglutination reactions. You're very uh, familiar with that. A very good example of agglutination reaction is your blood typing. Okay? Because again, that's the reaction of your antibody to an antigen. And then they clump together. Okay? Or agglutinate. Ayan. So your test forms, uh, it could differ. Number one is latex agglutination. In this case, what we use are latex particles. So the latex, the latex particles contain the antigens of the parasite that you are detecting. And then you are testing it for uh, the patient serum, if the patient serum has the antibodies. If the patient serum has the antibodies, then they will bind. And then they will form a lattice formation and then proceed to agglutination or clumping, okay? And another one is indirect hemagglutination. We use, by the name itself, heme agglutination, we use RBCs, okay? But in the surface of the RBCs, we put antigens there that are not normally found in the RBCs, okay? So example, we put um, antigens of the parasite in the RBCs, on the surface of the RBCs, okay? So these parasitic antigens are not normally found in your RBCs. But we then use the RBCs as a para a carrier, okay? It's a particle that will carry the, the antigens so that it can uh, react with your antibody easily, okay? And you can visualize, you can see the agglutination reaction clearly, all right, okay? And you have bentonite, again, uses bentonite na, uh, material or substance that is now coated with your uh, antigen. So this is bentonite. I think for bentonite, yeah, <laughs> the particles here, parang sand, bentonite, diba bentonite clay, something like that. Uh, bentonite, the sand there, or the substances, or the particles of bentonite, are coated with your antigen. Depending again on what type of antigen, what type of parasite you want to detect. Okay, and this is an example of latex particles um, in the, under the microscope. Okay, <laughs> alright, ayan. So, here's an example of an indirect agglutination. So, you have uh, the coated particle, again, latex, bentonite, RBCs, alright? are coated with the antigens. So, kanimong red, these are um, the antigens of the parasite. Again, when you say indirect agglutination, the antigens are not normally found, okay? Are not normally found on the carrier particle. So, example, these antigens that are parasitic antigens that you want to detect, okay? That you are testing, okay? But uh, these antigens, of course, are not normally found under normal circumstances in your latex, in your RBCs, alright? That's why it's called indirect agglutination. Okay, now you add your patient serum, which is um, expected to have antibodies back against the patient. 
Alright? Uh, against the parasite, against the patient. <laughs> you had the patient serum expected to have the antibodies against the parasite. So, of course, they will then bind and form a lattice. This is what we call lattice formation. And this will then precipitate or agglutinate out of solution. And then, that's now what we see as clumping in agglutination. Mga kumpul kumpul. This uh, example again in your blood typing. Mga clumping. Alright? That's positive result, agglutination or clumping. Okay. Alright, Okay. Uh, now we go on to the next, which is your immunodiffusion or gel diffusion. In this uh, case, your immunodiffusion, uh, we visualize precipitation reactions. Now, for precipitation reactions, precipitation reactions are similar with your agglutination reactions. Okay, they, they follow the same principle, but the difference lang, the difference is that precipitation reactions, the antigens are soluble, meaning they are in solution, they are quite small, but, but they are not solid. Okay? So that's the difference lang between precipitation and agglutination reactions. Okay? The antigens are soluble in precipitation reactions. Okay? Now for immunodiffusion or gel diffusion, we use again um, an agar gel. Diba? So I, I think you already know what an agar is. Diba? Intro to micro, yes, <laughs> All right. So uh, an example of immunodiffusion or gel diffusion is uh, an example of immunodiffusion or gel diffusion is your octorlone uh, double diffusion. So we, we cut two wells, actually three wells, in the agar gel, and then we put um, the antigens and the serum there. Alright, so we'll have a picture later. And then th what happens is the antigen and the antibody will diffuse, meaning they will move across the gel, alright, and then they will meet each other, and then they create a uh, precipitate, or precipitates a lot. They form precipitation reactions. Okay, alright. So here's an example. Ayan. So we have these are the wells. So this is the agar gel. Okay. So this is the well for your antibody or patient zero. And then you have two wells here for the antigen. Okay. Alright. So again, quite complex but to understand. Okay. But uh, for a simpler uh, demonstration, again, this is your picture. The antibody, again, um, is found here at the center. And then you have usually a known sample, which is the antigen, what we're looking for. And uh, that's diffusion, the bad double diffusion, meaning the, the antigen also moves and the antibody also moves. Alright? So they move, but meet sila together, and once they meet, they form what we call a precipitin ring. Okay? Alright. And this precipitin ring is now what we measure, what we observe. Okay? Alright. This is the precipitin band. Okay. Alright. So the precision of the precipitin band will allow for the comparison of, of the two antigens okay so the, this antigen is a control all right and this is the unknown and this antibody here is a reagent these two are reagents okay they are commercially manufactured all right and it's multi-specific meaning when you say multi-specific it can detect any antigen or it has a broad range of uh, antigen uh, detection and antibody multi-specific okay all right yeah okay. so we're looking for usually octorlone is used for detection of antigens. Okay? Alright. Okay. So that's for immunodiffusion. By the name of diffuse, diba? diffusion. Double diffusion, both the antigen and the antibody moves all right, throughout or within um, the gel medium. Alright? The support medium, which is your agar or gel. And once they meet to, uh, to each other, they form now what we call precipitin bands. Okay, that's immunodiffusion. Alright, okay. <laughs> now we go now um, to the next, which are your electrophoresis uh, techniques or electrophoretic techniques. If I recall electrophoresis, um, actually, uh, immunodiffusion, uh, we can modify that by adding electrophoresis with that. Uh, to that, uh, immunodiffusion. Diba? The previous slide, we can add electrophoresis, no? we can electrophorese the components in the immunodiffusion, okay? And that is now what we are going to discuss. No? So for electrophoresis, diba, if you can recall in your bio, can, ba? electrophoresis is the separation of uh, molecules, proteins ba, in their different bands depending on their mobility or movement in an electrical uh, field or electrical environment. Okay, And this is an example of uh, electrophoresis. Diba? The positive um, electrode is known as your anode because it's an anode because it can attract your anions and anions are negatively charged molecules so therefore para attract ng anions sa kanya so that the anions will attract to him or to it it must be positively charged so therefore anode attracts anions so it's a positive electrode and cathode is your cathode 
okay? Because it can attract your cations, okay? So it's the negative electrode. And the movement of your electrophoresis pattern is from the cathode to the anode. Please take note. It's from the negative to the positive. From cathode to anode, okay? Because in electrophoresis, most of your proteins will assume a negative charge, okay? And these proteins, negative charge, of course, they will attract the positive charge, okay? Now, example, you start here, okay? So, for electrophoresis, you then uh, let this uh, be flooded or be... Uh, yeah, be, be, be flooded in a way, <laughs> be uh, charged with electricity, the fractions of your sample will move into different fractions. Okay? Alright, so your sample here, starting here, once you apply electricity, electricity, it will move from cathode to your anode and it will be separated into your different fractions. Okay? Alright, that's for electrophoresis. Okay, the introduction to electrophoresis. Now, uh, we go now to immunoelectrophoresis. So again, when you say immunoelectrophoresis, this is immunodiffusion, pero we use now electrophoretic uh, patterns. We now um, charge it with electricity, okay? All right, so electrophoretic separation of antigens in a gel, and then diffusion of antibodies, and then we then look for precipitation uh, lines, okay? So again, to an, so this is an example, immunoelectrophoresis, all right? So for, for the procedure, so that you will understand more, so we have two wells on a gel medium, okay, agar pa rin, okay, and then we then uh, put the serum antigen in the well, and then we uh, subject everything into electrophoresis, or we uh, charge it with electricity, okay. What happens is, of course, it's now separated into different fractions, okay, after electrophoresis. So after electrophoresis, we then cut a well, or cut a trough at the center, and at the center, we then add your antibody, the reagent, okay? And after antigen separation, of course, again, a trough or a well, or para siya, yeah, well, or line bar or something, uh, <laughs> is placed at the center, okay? And this is where your antibody is placed, okay? And of course, since it's still diffusion, your antibodies and your antigens will then diffuse. Right? Double diffusion pa rin. So the antigens here, the patient, will diffuse here. Antibodies found in the well will diffuse also here. So double diffusion. And once they meet, they will form a precipitin band or lines. Okay? Alright. And these precipitin lines are what we compare in intensity and shape, whatever, based on the control. Okay? Alright. So here's an example of a picture again, of real um, IE film. So as you can see, um, patient has a monoclonal gamopathy, meaning natural disease with antibodies, all right? And uh, when you say monoclonal gamopathy, there's an increase in a specific, uh, a single type of antibody, all right, in the serum of the patient. So here's an example, diba? very difficult to understand and to interpret actually. So <laughs> the patient has IgM, ito, IgM, gamopathy with lambda light chains. So, Again, that's just an example. You don't need to memorize this, okay? But as you can see, di ba, we compare the, the shape, in a way, of the precipitin lines. So as you can see, for IgM here, the patient's uh, precipitin lines is of the different shape compared to control, di ba? So, in a way, that's how you interpret for immunoelectrophoresis, okay? All right, that's for immunoelectrophoresis. The point line is, again, it's immunodiffusion, pero we then now apply your um, electrophoresis. We then charge it with electricity. Okay, all right. Okay, now we go now to our next um, immunoassay. Okay pa kayo dyan, dears? Sana naman. <laughs> sige lang, baka mati ang eye, but... Um, sige lang, sige lang. All right, okay. Um, so, uh, for the next part, uh, the next uh, type, this is your immunoblot or your western blot. Um, Technique also as your immunofixation electrophoresis. So this is a modification of your immunoelectrophoresis. All right, and um, a, a very popular method is your Western blot. Okay, usually Western blot is used for um, HIV detection. Okay, diagnosis of HIV in a way. All right, so that's used. Um, Western, that is where Western blot is used for. Okay, HIV detection and all that. Okay, so more in your third year, then, Okay, all right. Now the difference now here is that. Uh, what we do is in a strip, no, in a nitrocellulose membrane, we then apply your sample and then electrophoresis. Okay, so after electro electrophoresis, the sample will then uh, be 
they are divided into fractions. Okay, so the antigens there will be exposed, whatever. Okay, but instead of um, creating a trough, diba, similar to immunotrophoresis for the antibodies, what we do is in the strip mismo, we then apply the antibodies, all right, and then those antibody those antibodies are then uh, but antibodies are applied to the strip okay so the antibodies and antigens on the strip will react so they will form immune complexes and then after a while um, let, we will wash it okay there's a washing stage and then after washing uh, a stain okay a color a stain is then applied on the strip okay and the immune complexes form will then be uh, given color or will then, will then be stained okay and this is what we examine or what we uh, measure in a way or what we visualize all right so here's an example Ayan. so the bus you can see the sample sp is the sample lane so it, let's say the sample started here okay you apply the sample here and of course electrophoresis happened so the sample is spread into different fractions okay so after electrophoresis you then apply the antibody the anti-serum okay the anti-serum antibody all right of course after Applying that they serum, they will bind to the antigens, okay, forming immune complexes, all right. And there's a washing stage, and then after the washing stage, you then include the stain, all right. And the stain will then color the immune complexes where they're, where they where they are formed, okay. All right. So these colors now are your um, immune complexes, okay. All right. Uh, the SP pala is your <laughs> reference rate, reference link, meaning this is the control, all right. Here now are your sample. <laughs> this is the sample pala. So as you can see, you then compare kung sino may mga color, okay? Those that with intense color. So as you can see, it's in the G and here in the lambda. So meaning the patient is experiencing an IgG. The GAM there stands for the different types of antibodies. So IgG, IgG, IgM. So it's an IgG with a lambda-like uh, shape. Ganun. Okay, so that's an example of interpretation lab. Okay, all right. So uh, as you can see, again, you look for the different mga colors. Now, na different, di ba? Example, in this part, compared to this part, di ba? This part is quite uh, thick. Okay, so it means that uh, this is the more immune complexes are formed there. So meaning, that is the predominant uh, type or that's the pro predominant uh, analyte that is found. Okay, because again, more immune complexes are formed. So it's still similar here, right? but intense and color. All right, so that's immunofixation, electrophoresis, or IF, yeah, IFA, immunoelectro, uh, immunoelectrophoresis. Pala. Okay, so again, a type of immunoelectrophoresis, and immunofixation, electrophoresis. Okay, all right, so yeah. reference link again, overlaid with the antibody to all the serum proteins that you are detecting. So this is the reference link, pala, ha? sorry, not the sample. Okay, the four here, uh, the five here, these are the sample. Okay, the sample links. So you put your samples here, serum sample from the patient, and then you then electrophoresis. Okay, you subject that to electrophoresis. Okay, all right, again. And for the last type of um, immunoassay, uh, based on electrophoresis, lang, is your counter immunoelectrophoresis. So for the counter immunoelectrophoresis, by the name itself, counter, uh, there's a movement of the antigen from one side and the antibody from another side, okay? And they will meet it to each other uh, and then form a precipitin line. So here's an example. Uh, so one part of the, one edge of the agar gel contains the specimen, which uh, again, in this case, your antigen, you're looking for an antigen, but, and then on the other side is the antibody. So you then apply um, electricity, and of course, both of them will move, all right, until they uh, meet. And once they meet, they form a precipitin band. And the distance is proportional to the amount of antigen present. So meaning, the the the, uh, <laughs> the farther the antigen, the farther the precipitin band is from the antigen, all right, it it means the more antigen is there, okay. And if it's uh, lesser, you no, know, if it's near like the closer the precipitin band is from the antigen, uh, from the antigen well, then it means that there is lesser antigen present. Okay, all right. So because again, um, proportionate, proportionate, proportionate. Okay, all right. Again. So again, the farther the distance, the farther the distance of your precipitin band, the more antigens are present. Okay, all right. And uh, for the last of the immunoassays, these are your enzyme immunoassays. <laughs> okay. So um, yeah. So I think that's the last one. So we'll continue with that on the last, uh, on the next video. All right, for pre-recorded lecture.
we're going to start now with your enzyme. 